Uh, we're Paul and Dominic, and in this talk, we'll explain and demonstrate the benefits of Apache Arrow for the web and beyond. Um, in this talk, we won't cover Apache Arrow, uh, so please watch a talk from Wes, who introduces the uh, motivation and ideas behind the Apache Arrow format. But for the purposes of this talk, you can think of Arrow as an efficient binary format for tabular data. And it's really establishing itself as a standard for many data processing systems. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Taylor. I've been an Arrow JavaScript committer since 2017. Um, I, my day job, I work uh, at NVIDIA, uh, GPU accelerating data science libraries. And formerly, uh, I was a co-author of Reactive Extensions for JavaScript and Falcor at Netflix. You can find me on Twitter at InlinePTX and GitHub at TRXCLLNT. And I'm Dominic. I've been an ArrowJS committer since 2021. I'm also faculty at uh, Carnegie Mellon University and a researcher at Apple. I work on data visualization tools and data exploration tool research more generally. Uh, you can learn more about my work at domords.de. So as I mentioned earlier, Apache Arrow is really establishing itself as a standard for data processing systems for tabular data. And there exist many different implementations in Rust, R, C++, Java, and so on. But of all these languages or all these implementations of the Arrow JavaScript uh, format and APIs, there's only one which really works natively on the web. There's a little asterisk here about a web assembly that we'll talk about later. And so because the JavaScript uh, implementation is the only one that works natively on the web, we think there are many applications web applications that can benefit um, and use this our uh, implementation. So for today in this talk, we want to show you some of the cool uh, advantages of this library and use cases for it. We'll start by talking about the Arrow JavaScript library, uh, some of the benefits and just in general how the implementation works. Then we'll talk about the advantages of Arrow as a format on the web compared to other standard uh, or other tabular formats like CSV and JSON and finally, some use cases. So talking about the Arrow JavaScript library, it is actually implemented in uh, TypeScript, which means it has optional type information. You can still use it from uh, a just pure JavaScript application, but the additional type information provides some additional safety and convenience. The Arrow JavaScript library is available in Node, which is a way to run uh, JavaScript on server and also, uh, of course, in the browser. We support uh, modern and legacy module format systems, uh, so ESM and CommonJS, and uh, also uh, support different implementations of the JavaScript standard, uh, going back to some of the older versions. So if you want, you can use the, the latest uh, versions of JavaScript and get all the benefits. Uh, but if you have a legacy system, uh, we also have bundles available for those. And finally, We've put a lot of effort into making sure that the Arrow JavaScript library is tree shakeable. What tree shaking is, is a way for a web application to only include of the JavaScript libraries that are being used, the parts that are actually needed. So if you load the Arrow JavaScript library in your uh, web application, but only use a small part of it, then um, you might only need a small part of the Arrow JavaScript library actually be included in your bundle. And that's very important uh, because on the web, you have to load all the application code into the browser before you can use it. So this is the Arrow JavaScript library. Uh, now we'll talk about some of the advantages of using Arrow on the web. And in particular, we'll compare to these other common formats like CSV, comma separated values, and JSON. The way CSV, CSV works is that you have one row of uh, all the headers. And then for each row in the data set, a new row in the, uh, in the file. It's a string-based format. So all the data, like dates, numbers, booleans, and so on, are represented as strings. And it is one row in the file for each row in the data set. Similar format is uh, JSON, where you would also have an entry for each row in the data set. But uh, it is uh, something in this, uh, this, this JSON format um, has some more strict escaping rules. So you have to quote all the 
uh, all the values, for instance, that are not um, not numbers or booleans. And uh, this format, this JSON format, is also natively supported by uh, JavaScript uh, APIs. So they can directly load this data, and then you can directly start processing on it. But it is a little bit longer, as you can see here. These two formats are row-based, meaning each row in the data set is represented as kind of an object in your data, or in, in the file. The disadvantage of this approach is that if you want to process data that exists in one column, let's say you want the average of the number column here, you would have to jump around in the file and find all the entries, put doing them together before you can start computing an average. Uh, there's an alternative where you transpose the data in a way and use this columnar JSON format, where each uh, column of the data is an array associated to uh, the name of the column. And this makes it more efficient for processing, but it's still uh, string-based. And also, you have to make sure that you align the lengths of the columns so that they all are the same. In Arrow, uh, which is a columnar format, so it has a lot of the benefits for analytics as this last approach here, it is a binary format that has some advantages over the string-based formats. In particular, uh, values are not stored as strings, but in binary format, which means also that more values can be represented in Arrow than in CSV or JSON. For instance, men cannot really be represented in a text-based format uh, without a particular convention, uh, but there is uh, native support in uh, the binary format that Arrow uses. So Arrow stores uh, this data um, for dates, uh, booleans, strings, numbers, and so on in binary format, which reduces parsing overhead, and also it's much more compact. Uh, and uh, that means we can reduce the file size. And so this format has advantages for uh, applications that load tabular data. In particular, if we compare loading CSV uh, or JSON versus Arrow uh, in this timeline here, where you could say, well, we send, start sending a request, which then um, gets sent to the server. The server processes that and sends a response back after some waiting time. Then that data gets returned to the, or gets sent to the browser. And there's some loading. Because Arrow is smaller, um, for, from, for a lot of tabular data, you might be able to start um, having your full data set loaded before it would be in CSV or JSON. Another huge advantage is, as I have here in the title, that there's no parsing overhead, which means as soon as the data is there, it's binary, uh, you can start accessing data in that binary blob and, and read the values out of it. Whereas in CSV and JSON, the text actually needs to be parsed before you have it in data structures that you can that you can work with, um, so you would have to have this this, this processing step in addition to that. Uh, moreover, the error format uh, supports streaming, which means you could even start processing right as after the waiting period. And Paul's going to talk a little bit more about that. So extending the the previous example even further, um, <clears throat> let's start from just when the the, the data set. Uh, starts loading. So uh, presumably you're loading this data so that you can do something with it. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't make sense just to have it in memory just so it can be there. You want to compute something with it. Well, Arrow uh, takes these tabular data sets and uh, separates them out into different chunks. Um, we call those chunks batches. So if you have a large table, let's say uh, a million rows, um, you wouldn't just want a single chunk of all million rows. You'd want to split that up into smaller chunks and load them individually. So the arrow format uh, allows you to describe, let's say, uh, it split these chunks up into a rows of uh, 1,000 per chunk. So once you start loading uh, the arrow table, it'll, you can get those chunks individually. And then you can actually start uh, running your compute operations uh, on that data as, it's, as it arrives. So while you're, once batch one arrives, you can start doing compute on it, let's say either in another thread, or if you're using something like async IO, um, that, that IO thread will, will uh, you can release that IO thread while you're running your compute. So uh, you can run your compute on the first batch while the second batch is loading, and run the compute on the second batch while the third batch is loading. And so this is overlapping uh, loading and compute time, um, which means that your, your entire load compute process can potentially be done uh, uh, 
you know, before CSV or JSON is even done loading sometimes. Um, this is, uh, we also support native uh, stream primitives in JavaScript. So JavaScript, whether you're in Node use, using the, the Node stream primitives, or whether you're in the browser using the, uh, uh, the what WG streams, um, or if you're just using regular vanilla JavaScript uh, and you, you want to use async await, uh, either iterables or async iterables, um, we made the, the streaming primitives because streaming is so core to the, the concept of the arrow and being able to, to compute on this data very quickly. Um, we, we wanted the, the surface area of the streaming primitives to be robust. So uh, we integrate with node streams, what WG stream, streams, and, uh, and just regular async iterables. So this is an example where we, we make a fetch request to the server to get some data. And then we uh, do a for await of loop and we process uh, each batch uh, on its own. And so while the, the reader is reading the next set of the next batch, we can do, be doing our computation uh, on, on some of the columns. The other thing that's important about Arrow that I want to call out is that it's ready for SIMD operations. So SIMD stands for single instruction multiple data. And uh, what that is, it's a concept uh, in vector processors, which allow you to load uh, multiple values into a cache line and then run uh, the same operation on all of those values. So uh, in order to, to take advantage of, instead of, the reason that's important is, let's say you load four values in and you want to do a sum. You can sum four values in a single instruction instead of uh, summing you know, number one plus number two, then number two plus number three, and number three plus number four. So uh, that's, that, that's really good for performance uh, in terms of speed, but it requires a few uh, prerequisites to be met. And uh, Arrow uh, was designed so that it meets those prerequisites. So let's say we've got this logical layout of this table on the left. It might describe uh, a table of, of uh, prices and then uh, you know, dates that, that something was purchased and then who purchased it. Um, so the first thing that Arrow describes is it describes the schema of the table as a little bit of metadata up front. Uh, so that, that schema includes information about the price column. Uh, is it a float 32? Is it a float 64? Um, it says there's a, a second column called date, and it even tells you whether it's a date uh, of days since the Unix epoch, milliseconds since the Unix epoch, you know, information like that. Um, and then it also we've got a string column called name, uh, and both the date and the name column include nulls. So the layout of the price column is, since it doesn't have any nulls, it can be uh, relatively simple. Um, it can just be a, a buffer of float values. Buffer, it's really important that that buffer be contiguous. So all the values, there'd be four byte numbers and it would be to, to the end of those four byte numbers. Um, that's just the data buffer for the, the blue column. Um, the, the date column though, it's a little bit more complex. It's one, it's dates, and those can be represented as integers, but it also has some null values. And in an analytics workload, uh, you might wanna know how many null values are there. You might wanna be able to very quickly uh, skip over null values. So the null values, instead of being represented uh, like a normal way they might be represented in JavaScript is, is there in, in the array itself? We actually split those out and those are represented in their own separate bitmap. So that's the null bits uh, where one and zero correspond to, to null or not null. It's actually separated out into its own buffer. And so the data can then just be contiguous with itself. Um, then the last column is, is strings and it's a little bit more complex. So again, it's got some nulls and those are still represented as a, a compact bit mask of nulls. But strings, uh, they have characters, and each string can be a different size. So uh, arrow separates out the strings as a buffer of offsets in the column of where each string starts and ends. So the first string starts it at offset 0 and ends at offset 6. And that would be uh, a map that you can go look up in the characters buffer for what those characters are if you care about them. But also, analytic workloads might not care about what the actual characters are. They might care about more, OK, what's the average length of a string? Um, and so uh, Arrow makes all these values contiguous. And these are just some relatively simple examples. Arrow can also be used to represent uh, you know, variable length data like strings uh, and lists, but also deeply nested data um, like maps and structs. So what does this allow us to do? This allows us to use things like multi-threading. Uh, so if you had the previous example, you might have uh, a large number, uh, a column a table with a large number of rows. And so you might want to uh, do some computation on each column in parallel. So if you could copy those columns into shared array buffers and then share them with different threads and compute in parallel. And this should work either in worker threads in the browser or worker threads in Node. 
And the next thing that you can do is you can take advantage of more exotic hardware uh, like GPUs to do uh, hardware acceleration. So if you have your input data as an arrow table of, for, for example, X, Y columns, um, you can have 169 million data points and copy them to the GPU directly and then use them in a shader, as opposed to something like GeoJSON uh, or you know, a text-based format, uh, where you might have to loop over all of the JSON objects, uh, depending on their structure, and then construct that buffer uh, on the CPU first and then copy it over to the GPU for rendering, you can actually just block copy an entire X column, and an entire Y column into the GPU very quickly and then use it to render. Another way to accelerate uh, programs on the browser is WebAssembly, which promises good performance in particular for compute intensive applications. Uh, WebAssembly or WASM, however, though, if we wanted to use it for Arrow, we found that it doesn't actually work as well. Uh, so as an experiment, we took the Rust implementation of Arrow and compiled it to WebAssembly. But we found that the communication overhead for each access to, uh, between the JavaScript and the WebAssembly context is, uh, is very slow. So it's actually faster to use the Arrow JavaScript library, at least for now. This might change in the future as the WebAssembly standard and the implementations are developing. However, Arrow can be a great tool for communicating between WebAssembly and JavaScript contexts. And this brings us to uh, some of the use cases for Arrow that we want to talk about today. The first one is uh, DuckDB Wasm, which is DuckDB, an embedded analytics database implemented in or compiled to WebAssembly. And this was done by Andre Kohn, who uh, was a PhD student at U Munich, and it what this version does is it offered un offers unprecedented uh, query performance uh, for these analytical analytics workloads. The way this implementation works is that a SQL query gets sent to the DuckDB client, um, which then sends that query to DuckDB. Uh, the cool thing here is that DuckDB, this WebAssembly version, is actually running in a worker. A worker is kind of the, the web equivalent um, of a thread. And so we have these two different contexts and they do uh, send the query as a string between these two workloads, between these two contexts. And then the result, which is a, a table, uh, gets returned back to the JavaScript context, for instance, for visualization in something like uh, Vega Lite or some other library. And the cool thing is we can use Apache Arrow as the communication format from this uh, WebAssembly context and the worker back to the JavaScript context. And then use the JavaScript uh, arrow implementation to actually access the values. So you kind of get a table uh, result back there. Yeah, and arrow really made it very easy and very performant to use the DuckDB uh, library in the browser. DuckDB is originally implemented in C++ and now available to everyone in the browser. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can go to this blog post. Uh, you can even try DuckDB Wasm at shell.duckdb.org we can write SQL queries over Parquet files uh, directly in the browser and uh, returns uh, results very quickly. So another use case uh, going into Node is actually GPU accelerating Node. So NVIDIA Rapids is a suite of uh, GPU accelerated uh, libraries for uh, data frames, uh, geospatial analytics, uh, graph analytics, and machine learning. Um, it's powered by CUDA and uh, it uses Arrow for input and output. So if you want to copy data between the CPU and the GPU, um, we can make that, that, that copy into the GPU very quickly. So this brings GPU accelerated analytics to Node.js. Uh, and you can learn more at, on our GitHub at github.com slash rapidsai slash node. So uh, some of these use cases might be you have a, a GPU server uh, with a single GPU, single client, uh, multi-client, uh, multi-GPU, multi-multi-node, uh, and so all of these you can use Arrow uh, to communicate the data between uh, the servers or the data between the client. You can do some GPU compute on the server and then send the data back down to the client uh, as an Arrow table. All of these gets accelerated by Arrow. Um, so, for example, you might have an Arrow file on disk, and you can load it uh, directly into the uh, GPU data frame, which allow you to do uh, you know various aggregations um, on on the, the data types there. Um, you can construct a graph 
from the data frame. Let's say the data frame has a source and a dest column, and you can uh, construct a graph from that. Um, and lastly, you could, if the data frame had, for example, uh, X and Y points that you wanted to plot, um, and you wanted to run uh, spatial indexing and spatial querying on the X and Y, uh, you could construct a GPU accelerated quad tree, uh, which will allow you to uh, run, run queries like point in polygon or point to nearest polyline. And so this is an example of uh, around 150 million uh, rows of uh, mortgage data uh, from the from uh, mortgage data set. So this this allows you to do uh, you know cross filtering, streaming uh, data between the client and the server, and then visualizing it. Um, and all of this can be made a lot faster by using the data frame APIs uh, on the GPU. So in this example, uh, this is plotting. Uh, uh, using the quad tree in rapids to do uh, geospatial spatial indexing and then point to nearest polyline. So about 169 million uh, taxi pickup and drop off locations. And we're, we're comparing them against their uh, taxi zone in New York. And we're, we're coloring each point by which taxi zone it's closest to. So uh, you can see in that slide, the, the, the bottleneck is actually, the, the shader is relatively inefficient. So the bottleneck is actually in uh, rendering the points, not in doing any of the spatial querying. And then the last slide is, uh, this is an example of, of running uh, graph analytics and uh, graph layout algorithm on a massive data set in real time. So this, this runs a force directed physics simulation and then uh, you know, draws nodes and, and edges uh, uh, in, in real time. Um, and so how to get involved? We would love to have more contributors. Uh, Dominic and I work on this in our spare time. And uh, we know our use cases, but uh, we love to hear yours. Um, we love bug reports, uh, and especially we love PRs. So um, you can get involved on the mailing list if, if you prefer email, uh, but we also have a Slack uh, for the Apache Software Foundation at the-asf.slack.com. Cool. Thank you so much yeah. for listening, and we look forward to hearing from you on the mailing lists and Slack. Thank you. Thank you.